Our speaker will be introduced by Hugh Doshbach, class of 1995. Hugh is a director on the San Antonio Alumni Chapter Board, and by day, he is owner and managing partner of Ascent Recycling and Consulting. Hugh? Thank you, Mary Kay. Dr. Erwin Cook was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and attended UNC Asheville, the Universities of Zurich and Freiburg, Columbia University, and UC Berkeley, where he received his PhD in 1990. Upon graduating, Dr. Cook was hired by the University of Texas at Austin in 1990 as their Homer specialist, and was a visiting associate professor at Johns Hopkins in 1993 to 94. Dr. Cook left UT for Trinity in 2003, where he was appointed the T.F. Murchison Professor for the Humanities. His appointment is in Classics, but he also teaches the Huma Great Book Seminar, and his courses are co-listed in History, Philosophy, and Religion. Dr. Cook's book, The Odyssey in Athens, was selected as one of the outstanding academic books of 1995 by Choice Magazine, and was reissued in paperback by Cornell University Press in 2006. He is also the author of over two dozen book chapters, articles, and reviews. One of his articles, Active and Passive Poetics in the Odyssey, has recently been anthologized in Oxford Readings in the Odyssey. Dr. Cook has delivered over 50 invited and refereed public lectures. That's 51 now, I suppose, today. <laughs> including a lecture at the Leventis Foundation Conference in Edinburgh, two Langford seminars at Florida State, and the Cook Athenaeum in Claremont, California. Other honors include his selection as a fellow of Harvard's Center for Hellenic Studies and the President's Associates Teaching Excellence Award at the University of Texas. Dr. Cook was also recently asked to write the introduction to a new translation of the Iliad for Johns Hopkins University Press. Today, he will lecture on the continued re relevance of the Iliad in the modern world. As you can see, he's got some great credentials, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Erwin Cook. If you don't mind if I close this up, I need space for my paper. Um, I didn't realize what a big deal this was, quite frankly, until I was told I had to wear a coat, which I, <laughs> I never did. But in a spirit of rebellion, I'm still wear, wearing my Birkenstock sandals, so, uh, okay. Uh, I initially, I have to tell you, I balked at the idea of lecturing on the contemporary uh, relevance of Homer uh, for a variety of reasons, but mainly because I'm of the camp that, that uh, maintains that anything that is as powerful and uh, profound as the Iliad is justified on its own terms and doesn't require uh, modern relevance, whatever that means. Um, but I also realize that my own self-justification here, um, uh, which also keeps me from studying ancient graffiti and medieval door knockers, uh, <clears throat> does assume that at some level of remove there are enduring qualities to these artworks that do indeed give them contemporary relevance. So instead of trying to sell the Iliad on these terms, I found I could do something more in the spirit of the original request and show how it allows us to see certain aspects of human nature and the human condition with what I hope will uh, be clear to you is, is sh virtually shocking clarity. In particular, I'll deal with the Iliad's unvarnished portrayal of the human will to power and the psychological damage that warriors sometimes uh, suffer on the battlefield. As the Iliad begins, Achilles has recently sacked several cities. Um, and uh, after the sack, he is awarded a, a, uh, a concubine named Briseis, and Agamemnon is awarded another named Chryseis. The father of Chryseis soon arrives at the camp and tries to ransom his daughter. He bases his appeal on an offer of gifts and his own authority as a priest of Apollo. Agamemnon brusquely dismisses the priest who retires to the beach and prays to Apollo for revenge. Apollo hears his prayers and causes a plague that kills many Greeks. On the 10th day, Achilles calls an assembly and asks if a prophet could explain why Apollo is angry. At that, Calchas stands up uh, and declares that the god is angry because Agamemnon dishonored his priest. 
So far, everything proceeds according uh, to a clear and orderly causality and is in fact a model of linear narrative. But what follows is puzzling in more than one way and is sure to be misinterpreted if we try to understand it with our own cultural assumptions. Agamemnon gives Calchas an evil look and says to him, prophet of evil, never once have you said anything good to me. All the same, I'm willing to give her back if that's better. I would rather the army be safe than to perish, but you must straightway make ready a prize for me so that I am not alone among the Argives without a prize, since that would be unseemly. Achilles replies by asking how the Achaeans can give him a prize since they've already been distributed. He nevertheless orders Agamemnon to give the girl up with the promise that the Achaeans will repay him with interest if and when they sack the citadel of Troy. Agamemnon replies, don't try to cheat me. You won't get past me nor persuade. Or is it because you want to have a prize yourself but me to sit around thus lacking one that you tell, her, uh, tell me to give her back? If the Achaeans do not give me a prize, I myself will take either your prize or the prize of Aeus or Odysseus. Achilles then asks Agamemnon how anyone will follow him in the future, for the Achaeans only came to Troy to secure honor for him and Menelaus. But now, he declares, you are threatening to take my prize, over which I have labored greatly, and the sons of the Achaeans gave me. Never do I get a prize equal to yours. Whenever the Achaeans sack a prosperous city, though my hands manage the bulk of the furious fighting. So now I will go back home to Thea. I have no intention of gathering goods and wealth for you here. Agamemnon bids Achilles to flee if that's what he wants, for there are others who will honor him above all Zeus. But, he adds, I threaten you thus. Um, since Phoebus Apollo is taking Chryseis from me, I am going to come to your hut and lead off your prize, Briseis, so that you will know how much more powerful I am than you, and another man would shudder to declare himself my equal. Achilles deliberates killing Agamemnon on the spot, but Athena descends from heaven and instructs him to withdraw himself and his men from the fighting, for, she says, you will receive three times so many gifts on account of this hubris. Achilles obeys. Now, in the 25 years that I've been teaching this poem, I always dread this discussion, uh, which always includes variations on the following from my students. Agamemnon is being petty. He is paranoid. He is an idiot. Achilles is acting like a spoiled brat. They're both acting like spoiled brats. If I'm really lucky, someone will ask, why did Agamemnon accuse Calchas of never saying anything to his benefit? Or, how did Achilles realize so quickly that Agamemnon wanted to take Briseis? Or even, why do they keep calling their women prizes? <laughs> Part of this we can dispose of rather quickly. To begin with Agamemnon's supposed paranoia, the poet tells us in his own voice that Apollo caused Agamemnon and Achilles to, to fight because Agamemnon dishonored his priest. He also said that Hera put it in Achilles' mind to call the assembly because she was troubled that the Achaeans were perishing. We know that Agamemnon is at fault and that Achilles is well-intentioned. But this is plainly not how Achilles, uh, Agamemnon uh, sees it, and he is far from being paranoid. It is in fact a fact of history that until World War II, more soldiers died of disease than in actual combat. Dysentery, in particular, was a constant threat. Seen in this light, Agamemnon sealed his fate the moment he did not return Chryseis, since plague in the camp was inevitable and when it would naturally be attributed to Agamemnon's offense against Apollo, who is the god of plagues. Of course, it still remained for someone to make that link, which may or not be real, whatever that even means, and which hardly matters when the army is dying. Agamemnon clearly thinks that Calchas, who has a nasty habit of making him lose young girls, has invented the link, and he suspects he knows who put him up to it. When Achilles asks for a prophet to explain the god's anger, Calchas stands up and declares he knows, but demands that Achilles protect him, for, he says, I believe I will anger a man who powerfully rules over all the Argives, and the Argives obey him. Achilles replies at once, take courage and speak the prophecy you know, for by Apollo, dear to Zeus, to whom you, Calchas, pray as you reveal prophecies, no one will lay heavy hands on you, not while I live, not even if you should name Agamemnon, who now boasts that he is much the best of the Achaeans. Why it is Agamemnon, Calchas exclaims. He dishonored the priest of Apollo. Agamemnon is then not the least bit paranoid. It seems obvious to him that Achilles has suborned the priest in order to make Agamemnon lose face. 
we're still left with the issue of psychology, which is only sharpened when we recall that Chryseus and Briseis are slaves, and that Achilles later declares he wishes Briseis had, declined, had, had, excuse me, had died rather than caused the quarrel that resulted in the death of Patroclus, someone he plainly cares even more deeply about than her. Why then does he nearly kill Agamemnon over her in this scene? And how, to repeat the question of my dream student, does he so quickly realize that Agamemnon intends to take Briseis? Finally, why is Achilles' love for Patroclus, which is clearly non-sexual in Homer, so intense that later critics have found it difficult to explain except in sexual terms? A full explanation invol involves us directly in the continued relevance of Homeric poetry. And to make my point, I will take two radically different approaches to the scene. One by comparing Homeric society to inner city gang behavior, and another comparing Homeric warriors to Vietnam vets suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. My discussion of the sociology of inner city gangs is largely based on Elijah Anderson's The Code of the Streets, which I've uh, included on your handout should you get interested in this. Uh, it's also, he did a, an article version of it in Atlantic Monthly, which is much shorter and you can read in less than an hour. Um, inner city gangs form a society within society with clearly defined num num members and rules. This society arises from a variety of causes, which include a lack of law, law enforcement, little or no support from society at large, a lack of institutional superstructures to protect individuals, internalized contempt, and rejection of society at large, general poverty, helplessness, and hopelessness. In short, it assumes a general uh, Weltanschauung, or, or worldview, of personal abandonment in a hostile world. Its effect is a general sense that there is little respect to be had, and therefore everyone competes to get what he can of the little that is available. Its further effect is that as soon as one decides to gain respect by being feared, structures emerge, leading to formation of the code of the streets. Features of the code include, above all, an obsession with respect. Respect serves as an intangible coat of armor. It is a form of intimidation designed to produce fear. The psychology of respect is not, however, simply based on self-preservation, but equally on the need to be compensated for a sense of insignificance, powerless, powerlessness, and a lack of alternatives in the wider world. It is thus an oppositional model in which a group is structured uh, by respect and turns its back on the rest of the world. Within this world, life regains its meaning. And in this world, of seeking and preserving respect, negotiations go on at a symbolic level that involve clothing, grooming, gait, demeanor, facial expressions, and looking. It is thus a form of prestation in which physical objects assert the respect one is owed. I wear this jacket because I can. Dissing is also a symbolic activity, but it can quickly translate into physical action. The insult does not need to be true. All that matters is that the speaker can make it stick. The code may center on one being granted deference. However, as people increasingly feel buffeted by forces beyond their control, what one deserves in the way of respect becomes more and more problematic and uncertain. As a result, the code provides a framework for negotiating respect. Whereas violence is a given, the code simply seeks to regulate it. A person's clothing and so on is thus designed to prevent aggression. That is, the goal is to perform an identity that prevents others from challenging your respect. The code is thus based on physicality and intimidation, and it is ruthless. A person who does not command respect may be in an immediate physical danger. Appearance is reality. Respect must therefore be negotiated in real time. It is hard to obtain, is defined by the group, has a quasi-material basis, is quickly lost, and is constantly under negotiation. People who live by the code have thin skins, and they are trigger happy. That is, they are super sensitive to slights, in part because they are possible precursors to actual violence. This is only exacerbated by their sense of alienation from society, which leads to bitterness and anger and further shortens their fuse. There can be no deferral in this system, both because of the possibility of violence and equally because there are no institutional superstructures in place to offer deferred redress. This lack of superstructures creates a profound sense that one must take care of oneself and of one's loved ones. As important, there can be no deferral because your self-worth is based on the group's perception of who you are. You or I might well walk away from being degraded because of our self-image, precisely because we do not have a sense of identity as a public, real-time negotiation. A gang member, by contrast, must respond at once, not least because if he loses respect in the eyes of the group, he is vulnerable. 
That is, there will be instant pressure by the rest of the group to lower his status still further. And so, if he loses an encounter, he may feel comp compelled to seek revenge to restore his honor. The gang member thus faces a double bind. High status invites challenge. Low status is worse, however, as it invites spite. Gang members learn the rudiments of the code already on the elementary school playground. As children, they form small groups that become their primary social bonds. In these groups, they test themselves against other kids in a campaign, in a campaign for uh, respect. Respect is then a zero-sum system, and disputes are a primary mechanism of establishing rank and structuring the group. The Code of the Streets is thus, in a sense, a more sophisticated and more lethal version of fifth grade playground. Put differently, we are never more authentically human than we are in fifth grade. <laughs> aggression uh, has a social meaning. That is, aggression defines the boys as individuals and structures the group as one boy succumbs to another's superior mental or physical powers. There is no place for humility in this system or mercy. Again, we see that the code involves self-preservation and public identity is what matters. An individual sense of self-worth counts for nothing. The code is thus a performance of, I am strong, I can take care of myself, and I love to fight, so don't even think about it. To the re return to the role of objects, wearing a pair of uh, Air Jordans is a direct assertion of status. The symbology of physical objects also requires a rhetoric of scarcity, of material poverty. On the other hand, if, out of fear of having his sneakers taken, a gang member wears a pair of Keds, he invites spite and could be assaulted for that very reason. He does not have the luxury of wearing Keds in a display of goofy chic or I don't care. In acquiring valued things, therefore, a person shores up his identity, but since it is an identity based on having things, it is highly precarious. Whereas some boys perform their status so well as, as to avoid being challenged, those unable to command respect this way are especially alive to the threat of being dissed. Conversely, the pressure on the person to have goods uh, required to perform his identity successfully will make him covet someone else's, especially if that person is perceived as weak and easy prey. And if he does take someone else's stuff, seemingly ordinary objects can become trophies imbued with symbolic value that far exceeds their monetary worth. That trophy can also be intangible, a person's honor stolen uh, by dissing him, for example. Women are among the most important objects that can be acquired or lost. Martin uh, Jankowski, who's also on your handout, claims that disputes over the possession of women are a significant source of tension within gangs. There is no area, he declares, more sensitive and none that could do more to destroy the unity of a gang than uh, arguments over women. Finally, a way of gaining respect from the group is to display nerve by performing an action that puts your life at risk. True nerve is thus a public display of a lack of fear of dying. Being prepared to die garners respect and death is pre preferable to losing it. Those uh, who behave in this manner often lead an existential life that may acquire meaning when they are faced with the possibility of imminent death. Now, I hope you've already made some immediate and significant connections between the situation in the Iliad and Anderson's account of uh, gang behavior. In fact, I want to claim that the code of the streets, the heroic code, uh, and the rules of Homeric society are almost identical. For example, we see at once that both societies are obsessed with honor. From the code of the streets, we can infer that the Greek obsession with honor implies feelings of insignificance, helplessness, and poverty. More important, it leads to the further inference that this is a normal human response to such feelings. As an oppositional model, we can see the heroic code as the product of largely environmental factors, noting that we, for the most part, are insulated from uh, nature, while ancient man felt himself subject to vast and often hostile forces that he proceeded to personify and sacrifice to. As for dissing, we see that Achilles' eloquence in insulting Agamemnon is a fundamental part of the symbolism of honor. In other words, it owes its importance in part to the fact that honor is a symbolic economy. On the other hand, Achilles is so quick to infer that Agamemnon will take Briseis because it is a cultural assumption that both will engage in such activity. For the same reason, Agamemnon wrongly infers that Achilles is engaged in a naked power grab. It is also clear why it is not important to Agamemnon whether the prophecy of Calchas is true. All that matters is that he delivers an authoritative performance that Agamemnon cannot refute, though he can attempt to nullify its effect by taking Briseis. 
We also see that honor is very much a zero-sum system. Agamemnon can only understand losing his honor in terms of Achilles gaining it, in relative or even absolute terms. In that honor is negotiated in real time, it is difficult, if not impossible, for Agamemnon to accept the deferral of compensation that Achilles offers him. What is truly remarkable and requires divine intervention to achieve is that Achilles defers revenge for the insult Agamemnon inflicts. This issue is exacerbated by a complete lack of institutional superstructures that could be used to manage their conflict. Moreover, honor is concretely embodied in physical objects. Briseis is, in effect, a pair of sneakers, and Achilles and Agamemnon are engaging in blood sport over who gets to wear them. Hence the insistence on calling her a prize. This again implies a rhetoric, if not the reality of material scarcity. And it is a blood sport because to lose honor is not only to become vulnerable, it is an outcome even worse than death since honor is the only thing worth living for. Above all, we are allowed to see what the stakes are for Agamemnon and Achilles. As Agamemnon sees it, his entire enterprise of being at Troy is at stake. While for Achilles, what's at stake is the meaning of his or even human existence. If, following Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, we accept that the will to power defines us as human, then Homer is probing a very central nerve. In other words, the epics allow us to see the basic drives that exist within all of us, which Homeric society simply attempts to regulate rather than to disguise or to suppress. Now that we've established its relevance, and I hope we have done this, uh, we can add to our understanding with a more detailed anthropology of Homeric society, which is structured through agonistic exchange, or what's often called competitive reciprocity. Uh, specifically, what I hope to add is that variations of the social dynamics we have observed can emerge under any egalitarian system, including our own, by the way, although it may be disguised by cultural sanction. Marcel Mauss teaches us that all exchanges are prestations of things integral to the social construction of ourselves. Trade is thus domesticated warfare, or in Freudian terms, capitalism is a sublimated version of the heroic code. Let me repeat that. In Freudian terms, capitalism is a sublimated version of the heroic code. Moreover, even friendly exchange is disguised agonistic exchange. Egalitarian reciprocity thus creates hierarchy through being outsmarted, simple errors of judgment, and coercion. Georg Zimmel uh, calls attention to the tensions underlying all social exchange. Specifically, economic exchange always involves sacrifice and resistance, and value, in fact, derives from precisely this. The social risks of exchange are therefore enormous, while the nature of exchange invites cunning and outright deception. A gift, a gift is thus an imposition of identity, and even an unequal exchange influences both parties. Now, membership in Homer's society is thus the result of performance, of performing one's elite identity and having that performance accepted by others. Status is the result of competitive exchange. One establishes one's rank by competing until meeting one's match. To refuse to compete is to lose. Goods are, and are properly acquired by competitive means, including gift exchange, marriage, and violence. Athletic competition, viewed as domesticated combat, is another means. Theft and trickery are also legitimate. The thief has proved that he's the better man, provided the theft uh, remains unavenged. Both warlike and peaceful exchanges are designed to transform equals into unequals. No status can be acquired by competing with someone beneath you, therefore. Conversely, aiming too, too high is a recipe for death, or worse. There is a relentless pressure on the individual to measure his abilities and those of his possible opponents. Such competition requires witnesses since its function is social. In that the status one is given by the very peers with which one competes, the opinions that count are the ones most grudgingly bestowed. Risk is therefore greatly exacerbated by the fact that honor is a public construct. construct. Failure is immediately known to everyone in the group. So the Iliad then on this reading is about rank about who is the best of the Achaeans, and it exposes a problem at the heart of elite competition. Agamemnon believes he is the best of the Achaeans because he rules the most people. Achilles believes that he is the best because he is the greatest fighter. Nestor reveals that his status that he is the best uh, uh, counselor by not asserting that this makes him the best of the Achaeans. Agamemnon then uses his standing within the political system to deprive Achilles of status one in the fighting system. 
Achilles thus believes he is owed compensation that will acknowledge his true worth. Agamemnon believes he cannot jeopardize his social standing by giving Achilles what he wants. So much for the sociology and anthropology of Homeric society. Further light can be shed on the poem by looking at modern combat veterans suffering from PTSD, and I want to argue vice versa. That is to say, we can understand modern combat veterans by reading the Iliad uh, closely. Uh, a breakthrough in this regard came in 1994 with the publication of Achilles in Vietnam by Jonathan Shea. Uh, Jonathan, uh, uh, I use his first name because he's actually a friend of mine, is a doctor of clinical psychology who has devoted, mu who has devoted much of his career to treating Vietnam vets uh, suffering from the disorder. In the book, Shea argues that PTSD tends to arise from feelings of betrayal. This results in shrinkage of a soldier's social and moral horizons until it only includes a close friend or two. If the friend is killed, the soldier feels guilt and often goes berserk. If matters go this far, psychological damage is real and sometimes permanent. Superior officers, uh, referred to endearingly as REMFs or rear echelon motherfuckers, are comparable to the Homeric gods, uh, constantly interfering on the battlefield in irritating and even deadly ways. Ways of preventing and mitigating PTSD include honoring the enemy, proper grieving for the dead, and communalizing grief and trauma through narrative, such as the Iliad. In all these ways, Shea sees the ancient Greeks as dealing with PTSD more effectively than the U.S. did post-Vietnam. Part of this is uh, due to what he finds to be the tendency of modern uh, Western religion to demonize one's opponent, and another to the unfortunate fact that uh, war was a way of life in the Greek world, which had to which had to therefore have effective strategies for dealing with psychological trauma as a simple matter of survival. That his audience consisted almost exclusively of combat veterans also ensured that uh, Homer's description was psychologically authentic. Again, I hope that at this point you're way ahead of me. Uh, Agamemnon inflicts moral injury on Achilles by taking Briseis. He does so by breaking the social contract to which Achilles at once calls attention, according to which soldiers follow leaders into war so that they can win status by risking their lives in combat. By reducing status, as measured by prizes, to the whim of the leaders, he has left Achilles with no reason to risk his life uh, by fighting. Whereas Vietnam soldiers withdraw psychologically, Achilles does so physically. But both do so because the higher-ups have violated the soldier's sense of what is right. Any soldier, Shea claims, and this I find just absolutely stunning because he, he is making a claim about cultures that are 2,500 years apart and continents apart, right? Any soldier, right, uh, will respond with violent rage and social withdrawal under such circumstances. His rage and withdrawal leaves Achilles especially vulnerable when his closest friend Patroclus is killed because Achilles himself sent him into war but did not accompany him. Shea's response to scholarly puzzlement over the closeness of their bond is that we classicists don't get out much. Uh, and specifically, we are not vets, okay? Which is, in my case, completely true. But on both, uh, both accounts, but never mind. Uh, uh, the, the result of that rage is a battle in which Achilles so dominates the fighting that not a single other Greek fighter is mentioned for two full books. He is, in short, berserk. Yet his ability to share his grief with Priam at the end of the poem restores Achilles to his humanity. Shea also identifies a Homeric type scene known as the Aristea, or lone hero dominating the battle battlefield, and that's on your handout, uh, as the formal narrative structure for berserking, or that is used to describe berserking. Type scenes now are repeated uh, scenes, such as sacrifice, that tend to follow the same general structure. The Aristea, or lone fighter fighting at his best, is used to structure all the major battle sequences in the Iliad. Its typical features include uh, the ones listed on your handout, and I won't uh, read through them, but I'm going to take you through an Aristea so that you can see what it looks like and actually also see Homer play a game with our expectations. So to illustrate, I'll not use Achilles' much longer Aristea uh, and more complex Aristea, but the Aristea of his uh, surrogate, really in many respects, Diomedes. Diomedes' Aristea includes the following, in which only element three is missing, though even it could be uh, included if I wanted to get really ingenious. Um, so what I'll do is simply paraphrase uh, what he does on the battlefield and show how it lines up with, with the elements of the Aristea. So element one, then in turn, Paulus Athena gave strength and courage to Tidius' son Diomedes so that he would be conspicuous among the Argives and win noble fame. 
Element two, she kindled weariless fire from his helmet and shield, like the star of autumn, which shines especially bright when it is bathed in Okeanos. Element four, Phaedrus and Idaios separate, separate themselves from the ranks and face Diomedes. Diomedes kills Phaedrus. Other Greeks kill their opponents. But, Homer says, as for the son of Tydeus, you would not know which side he was on, whether he consorted with Trojans or Achaeans. Element five, Pandarus, the archer, stretched his curved bow against Tydeus' son and struck him as he ran on the right shoulder. Element six, then indeed, Diomedes, good at the war cry, prayed, hear me, child of Aegis-bearing Zeus, be kind to me, Athena, and grant that I kill this man and that he come within range of my spear, the one who struck me first and then boasted over me. Elements seven and eight, Athena stood near and addressed him. Be of good courage, I have put paternal might in your chest. Moreover, I have taken the mist from your eyes, which was formerly upon them, so that you may well recognize both God and man. Straightway, Tydeus' son went and mingled with the foremost fighters, and though eager before at heart to fight the, to fight the Trojans, then three times the rage got hold of him. Element eight, Diomedes kills many Trojans, including Pandarus, and he wounds Aeneas. Ele element eight now is set up to look like our climax. When Aeneas sees Diomedes mowing down the Trojans, he appeals to Pandarus for help. Diomedes' charioteer Sthenelus sees him advancing and declares, Come, let's fall back in our chariot. Do not rage like this among the front ranks, for fear you will lose your sweet life. Now, that line by Sthenelus is meant to be pretty humorous, as it's tantamount to saying, Please don't fight, it's dangerous. Okay. Uh, Diomedes replies in anger that of course he will fight, and if he manages to kill them, then Sthenelus is to drive off Aeneas' horses as a war prize. In the event, Diomedes kills Pandarus in revenge and goes on to wound Aeneas, whose fall Homer describes with a formula that normally indicates the warrior in fact dies. Aphrodite then tries to whisk Aeneas off the battlefield in a comic reprise of the rape of Helen, whereupon Diomedes wounds her. When she ascends to heaven in distress, the audience is prepared to believe that the Aristea is now over. Uh, he has, after all, just wounded an Olympian god. But the poet then returns us to the, battle, to the scene of battle to find Diomedes still attempting to kill Aeneas, even though Apollo is now protecting uh, him. Back off, the god commands, and Diomedes does so a little bit, the poet adds slyly. Now surely, we think, the Aristea is over. Uh, the god himself has marked the limits, one might even say of human striving. But no, when Ares enters the battle, Diomedes stands down as Athena earlier instructed. Then Athena returns and takes the reins of, as Diomedes' charioteer. I mean, think of this. Athena is your charioteer? I mean, come on. It doesn't get better than this if you're a hero, right? Um, okay, so, and the two of them then uh, take off and wound uh, Ares. So, after two false closures, each serving to heighten the drama of the actual climax, we get that climax, together with the double simile that marks the formal conclusion of Diomedes' Aristea. There follows element nine, a double simile in which Ares' cry when Diomedes wounds him is likened to that of 10,000 warriors in battle, followed by likening his ascent to heaven to that of a storm cloud. Now, from a psychological perspective, as outlined by Shea, Diomedes suffers a triggering event when Pandarus shoots him with an arrow. Note that archery is treated as a sneaky and even cowardly mode of fighting in Homer, precisely because one can do so from a safe distance while catching one's opponents unawares. Note that Diomedes expresses outrage at both the attack and the presumptuous boast that follows, uh, in which Pandarus claims Diomedes will soon die from his wound. Boy, did he get that wrong. Um, among modern vets, such events often involve feelings of betrayal. Their leaders issue stupid warriors, uh, stupid warriors, well, maybe they do that too. Uh, their, their leaders issue stupid orders, uh, their equipment malfunctions, that's a, that was a, apparently a really serious one in, in Vietnam, uh, and so on. Frequently during the fight, during the height of their uh, battle rage, soldiers suffering acute PTSD say they feel invulnerable, superhuman even. This has a direct analogy in Athena's appearance and its effect on Diomedes. But note that Diomedes already seems out of control during his initial exploits, when the poet declares that you would not have recognized whose side he was really on. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the poet clearly marks Diomedes' acquisition of new powers. The mist is lifted from his eyes, his battle rage increases, and he gets a special weapon, consisting of none other than Athena as his own charioteer. It is important to note in this context that Homer seems to see this as a good thing, or at least as an awesome thing, okay? So I'll conclude by asking you to consider Homer's technical achievement 
and Shea's uh, social or strategic victory. First, the technical achievement, which I would again argue already makes Homer relevant to any modern reader who appreciates such things. Simply put, battles on the scale of those in Homer are massive, random, chaotic, and all but impossible to describe without likewise being massive, random, chaotic, and as a result, boring. <laughs> Very few stories of actual warfare are any good as a result, yet war narratives remain hugely attractive in part because the, of the, uh, the existential tragedy of man and the drama and psychology that accompany it are ever present on a scale that can feel downright superhuman. Homer's solution to the problem, his way to impose order on the chaos, was precisely the aristeia, which also makes an ideological statement, namely, individuals matter. What had largely eluded scholarship until Shea came along was that the aristeia is also a psychological transcript, the narrative of traumatic stress and the psychological uh, disorder that issues from it. When Shea first started treating Vietnam vets, in addition to their physical and psychological injuries, they had suffered from years of neglect and indifference. As many of you can personally attest, this was in uh, part a tragic <laughs> consequence of America's own conflicted views on the war itself. And this is another point uh, to which Shea calls attention. Whether you or I support a given war, we are morally obligated to support the ticker, tra uh, the ticker tape parades when the soldiers return. It is enormously important for their well-being and the well-being of all of society to help them feel that they have truly returned and to give them instruments to communalize their grief and their suffering. In short, what Shea accomplished was to tap into the enormous cultural prestige of Homeric epic to show that the suffering of our veterans is a universal human experience. By relocating Achilles to Vietnam, he made it possible for our own vets to tell their stories and for their voices to be heard. And it doesn't get more relevant than that. Thank you very much. Any questions? I've stunned you into silence. <laughs> Yeah, well, the entire concept of PTSD is now being renegotiated because it's seen as far more complicated than it was in 1994. Uh, but moral injury is, is the heart of what Shea sees as uh, causing the onset of, of, the, of, the, beha or of, the, of the of the disorder, if I can just use uh, the term that he used back then. Uh, so that this, I think the discussion is going, to, in all honesty, is going to look a lot different in about a decade because we're just now really readdressing some of the basic assumptions of what PTSD is and even if that's the appropriate term to use. Uh, the biggest point that Shea would want me to stress though is that this is real psychological injury. But as I said, we're, we're still learning what we're talking about and, and unfortunately we've got a, an incredible opportunity to study it right now. So um, I, th I suspect we're going to know a whole lot more about it uh, within this generation. So. Along this same line, I have a, an acquaintance who is a, he's a, a veteran of the Iraq War. He's still in the Army. He had to go on, uh, <clears throat> on an assignment to retrieve the bodies of some of his colleagues in his squad who had died when their Humvee was blown up. And now he occasionally sees them in formation when they are lined up. He mm -hmm. thinks he sees them. Uh, I wonder if Homer ever dealt with uh, people suffering from that, where they would actually imagine seeing their dead friends, uh, colleagues, alive. That's, that's a great question. I can take you to a passage that I, well, l let me describe the passage and then uh, okay. see if you, what you think about this. Uh, in book 23, Achilles is sort of in a arrestive sleep, and Patroclus actually appears to him and says, I need you to bury me. 
Okay. Now that's that's you know from a sociological standpoint, that's actually what's called a, a cultural misrecognition. What what the society needs is to bury him, not the deceased, right? Um, but he, he lays a s serious guilt trip on, on Achilles, and Achilles leaps out of bed and tries to embrace him, and the guy just disappears right through his arms. Um, so this is clearly a kind of waking dream, and it's, and it's arguably the only hallucination that Homer describes in either epic. There's, there's one other uh, passage in the Odyssey that I would, that I would argue could be a hallucination, but um, it, it, it's, it's pretty strikingly hallucinatory. And it's precisely a vision of, of a deceased comrade. Okay. You mentioned uh, earlier about the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus, mm -hmm. and how uh, it's kind of being misread uh, in contemporary society. And I gotta admit, I was one of the ones who misread it when I first read it because it, they seemed a lot closer than right. when I was. I said, "Oh wow, you know, uh, these soldiers are very close." Uh, can you give us a little more uh, context and how to view the relationship? Well, is yes. Um, Shea calls particular attention to the intensity of the bonding that takes place with uh, between combat veterans, who, especially when they've had a lot of their uh, fellows die around them, they tend to, you know, their 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 space collapses and they become incredibly close, uh, which of course makes the stake of one of them dying uh, that much. Uh, worse. His conclusion from having interviewed all these vets and talking about their buddies and things like that was that uh, Achilles' grief could not have been any greater if they were lovers, nor would it have been any less if they weren't. You know, in other words, it's a complete irrelevancy uh, from the standpoint of the bonding, that this is simply what happens when you're in constant existential crisis, uh, sometimes for months or, or even years on end. So. Okay, I thought you were going to say Troy, and I was going <laughs> to dis disappear behind this podium. <laughs> and if so, do you think so, and how? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the Coen brothers, if I, if I am correct on this, have also disavowed ever having even read the Odyssey. Uh, so um, I, I can believe that, having seen the movie. Uh, but there are s so many scenes in it that, that seem to... Got, get some real traction from knowing the Homeric, if I can use this term, intertext. You know, the, seeing it bounce off of Homer, you know, the, uh, the radio uh, station owner for me is just flawless in, in that regard. And, and the Cyclops, I can't remember, is that John Candy? Is, okay, uh, yeah, that, that was, I, th I thought that was just flawless. I mean, that was just exactly, handled exactly right. So, um, but at the end of the day, I mean, I, I don't think, your enjoyment of that movie depends on your being uh, particularly familiar with the Odyssey. <laughs> you had said something about the use of archery being ignoble and kind of a dirty trick. That Harper's Magazine, which for some reason is in my purse, in the, in the Harper's Index, the first two things they have listed are chance that a U.S. combat pilot suffers from a mental health problem is one in 17. That a remote drone pilot does is one in 12. That seemed kind of put together. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the, you know, there's no question that somebody that is themselves a remote fighter probably has a statistically less chance of suffering from the kinds of uh, traumatic stress that somebody that's actually on the battlefield. Um, although Shay's would come right back at me when I say that and say that uh, actually by insisting that your opponent is a fellow human being that has dignity and honor, um, you so dramatically lower the chance of that person suffering stress, there's probably no real difference uh, between the two. Um, it is, however, true that in the Iliad, uh, Paris, who's the most notorious archer, and Pandarus are complete flakes. 
you know, um, the, the, you know so um, what, what you want to do with that, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but, uh, you know, there, there, the one thing you can say without question is that, that you know, it, it's against the ide ideology of Homer. I mean, if, if the idea of going out into that battlefield is to try to take down the biggest possible game you can, and you're going to acquire status as a result of doing that, um, then you gain nothing by just taking an arrow and shooting it up into the air. Uh, even if you took down Agamemnon, it wouldn't, it wouldn't do much for you. Um, it's it's the, precisely the risk that, that makes this meaningful. Um, so. Thank you. I appreciate that.